Hey, how are we? Um, we're just starting the streaming process. Um, you've got to, you know, give us a bit of time. We're still figuring out the technical issues, but um, I'm about to share this to the world. One second. So just uh, hold your horses for one second. We will be with you very shortly. I turn down the mic. So it should be, so it should be streaming to that page, right? Mm -hmm. Cool. So uh, it is live. Okay, so share this to my personal page. I don't know. So, so I search, shared it to my personal page. Reese will share it to his, I think. I don't even know if I forgot you as a friend, bro. You are my friend. Am I your friend? You are my friend. Of course you are. Oh, yeah. No, I'm not. What? Well, that's right. friend. Friends. Facebook official now. Okay, so we've got one person <coughs> watching. Cool. So right now it's just your logo. Yeah. Can, I, can, I, do a, can I ask a favour? Of course. Do whatever you're going uh, Before you start. So is this your thing? Can yeah. I just change this? What yeah. do you want to be called? What do you want to call it? Just because it's... Concepts of Calenda, streaming live. Do you want to type it in? Yeah. Man, that's what is that? A galaxy? Yeah. Uh, no, it's a pixel. So you can hear us. Great. So, so this is I'm sharing this with all of my friends. When you're ready. Okay. So I think we're still going. Confirming. Friends with this dissolver. Okay. So. It should be on my page, so it should be, if I'm not mistaken. So it's, 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 do we, is there any way we can see how it's playing? Ah, oh, I can see how many shares are going, cool. Yeah. So I've shared it. I'll share it now. You're sharing it. Has it come up as though I've shared it? Because I have. Yeah, I think it has. And you're happy because they, they can hear this as well. No, it's the mic's off. Mic's are on. Yeah, the mic's not on. But they can hear that, can't they? Yeah, it was, it was volume. Okay, well, the mic shouldn't be on. <laughs> Say hello, B. Say hello, B. Um, um, cool. All right, so... I, I'm sharing. I, we're sharing? Well, then, I think we, we go to the world, boys and girls. I, I just want to confirm that it, it worked from my end. Did I... Yeah, well, I, I think it does. Let me, let me give it a bit of a while. Let's you don't get a world. notification. Boys and girls. Yeah, it's work. It's working. Reese is watching. Yeah, it's working. Okay, perfect. So only only Reese is watching. Did you see it from my personal page or from the concepts with Kalanta page? From the your public page. Okay. Only, okay. So I'm coming across as a ah device. yeah cool. No, it's live. We are live, boys and girls. I've just looked at my wall and uh, I'm coming across as a bit of a Jahan. Fanboy. <laughs> my last two posts are both about you. Oh, you're, you're the best. You're a good friend. Um, hello, everybody. This is the first podcast of Concepts with Kalanta. I'm Jahan Kalanta, your host. Um, this is really exciting to have an opportunity to do this. Um, I guess the background of the podcast, uh, before we introduce our guest and sort of get into what we're talking about, is that I've kind of had a realization, which was that I in the practice of law, I've become really pretty good at one thing, which is law. I've put well over 10,000 hours into it. And in doing so, I've kind of not learned about a lot of the other beautiful things that this universe has. And I'm curious, I'm excited, and I, I think that a lot of people share this, this problem that you kind of become so focused in what you're doing that you... Let me just turn the feedback down. There you go. There we go. Um, uh, you become so focused on what you're doing that you don't really know much about the rest of the world. So um, that's what Concepts with Kalanta is about. I want to give you a taste of an experience that's different to yours. Um, I'm going to find guests that are incredible people. I'm going to check their credentials for you. I'm going to vet them. I'm going to make sure they're interesting. And they're going to take us through a concept, a concept that's deeply personal to them, that they understand far better than I do. And we're going to be educated on that concept. And taking it forward, what we're going to do is be able to leave this podcast, being able to have a pretty high level discussion about it. You're obviously not going to become an expert after a one hour podcast, but it'll give you a flavor of what's happening. And with that flavor, you can go out there and sort of decide what you're going to do. Which brings me to my guest of the day, Mr. Reese Ledadazzi. 
<laughs> I pronounced that. I butchered that, didn't I? It's close enough. <laughs> now, Reese and I are, um, we've been friends for about a year and a half, two years now. Um, Reese was a student of mine um, at, the, at the law school I taught at. Um, and Reese is going to talk to us sort of about the concept of awakening. Reese's story is a fascinating one to me. He's, a, he's an athlete who turned agent who's now on the path of becoming a philosopher. And how does someone go through that journey is something that's really interesting. So welcome. Thank you. Thank you for having me. You're very welcome. You're very welcome. Um, tell me this, Reese. Um, let's start at the beginning. Um, tell me a little bit about your, your sporting background. Well, I grew up in a country town where you play rugby league. That's what you do if you're uh, from a small country town in New South Wales. And that was always the dream. Um, and I got relatively good at rugby league. Um, but I was never going to be great. Um, just, just pretty good. Moved through the grades, as they say. Um, and then um, went and played rugby union in Europe, uh, largely based on being a dual citizen of Australia and Italy. So I was a local in Europe. Mm -hmm. um, and that's, that's sort of the, the extremely brief summary of the athlete journey. Um, but as I was wrapping up in Europe, um, I'd always had one eye on after footy because I did well in school and I had other interests, which a lot of people don't play with and against, don't it? Yep. <laughs> um, and was for some time uh, fairly interested in the agent world representing players. Um, I had some good and bad agents myself. I saw that I could make a difference in, in that area. Um, and, and yeah, really, really started knocking on doors, asking what I could do here and there with, um, in particular, the agency that represented me. Yep. Worked for them uh, for some time. Um, and then for many reasons, um, pro probably uh, the most interesting uh, sort of side of this is based on the content I was consuming, books I was reading, started to think that there may be some things out there that are a bit more important than sport and money, actually. Um, got very interested in philosophy, had been studying law anyway as a platform for the agent work. Yep. And now I'm trying to tie it all in. Um, and moving forward, um, some would hope that will be my life. Okay, awesome. That was a pretty good summary, actually. Thank you. Yeah, and it's like really slowly. I, I feel it might be boring for a listener. No, not at all. Because it's very unusual for someone to sink in the 10,000 hours into something, which I'm sure you did with your sport. That would have been, I'd be shocked if it was less. Yeah. Um, and then decide, you know what, this is, this is not who I want to be going forward. You know, sports, I guess, a different sort of world because those skills that you learn in the sporting field are not transferable, but the attributes, I'm sure, are tenacity, hard work, determination. Yeah. All of that, I'm sure, transfers really well. But the question I want to ask is why philosophy? I mean, there is a million other things that could be of interest to somebody. I mean, were you very studious younger in life? Were you the kind of person who read a lot of books, were you the kind of person who went to a lot, listened to a lot of podcasts, consumed a lot of content like that? By the age of maybe 21, 22, I'd read one book, Tiger Woods Biography. It's a good book. Yeah. Um, studious, no. Curious, yes. Um, I've tried to work out whether I uh, didn't think it was cool or, or something like that. I'm, I'm in catch-up mode, as you know. Um, Three book a week type person. If I'm sitting still, I'm reading. If I'm in the car, I'm listening to an audio book. So that's potentially um, a main element of this uh, sort of journey, uh, the, the awakening, well, so to speak. Well, that's the, that's that's what amazes me because I remember you told me this some time ago, and I remember thinking there's no way that someone who reads as vigorously as 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 widely read as you are now has only read one book. And 
Tell me this, what is the book that you attribute? Is there one book or one author that you attribute to being the person that sort of sparked this in you? Jeez, I wish you'd asked me that two weeks ago to give me a bit of time to think. There's definitely a group of books. Um, the God bashing books of the, uh, the Four Horsemen. Um, so that is for anyone who doesn't know, Christopher Hitchens, God is not great. Sam Harris's end of faith, Daniel Dennett's, um, breaking the spell and Richard Dawkins, the God delusion. They changed my life. Um, Eckhart Tolle's The Power of Now. Great book. Another sort of... Very good book. ...moment of... Well, I might be on the feed today. Awakening, so to speak. Um, the concept is awakening. You can say the word awakening. Oh, well, yeah, no, I can. As I, many times I, as you like, because that's what it's about. Sure, sure. <laughs> I, I should perhaps make a note, though, that it is a somewhat uh, uncomfortable term. When, when you're talking about yourself, it yeah. feels... Um, it feels quite normal in modernity to attribute it to someone else. But when you think of your own awakening, um, it's it's difficult to describe or, or consider. I mean, people don't consider it. So, Well, you know, I was doing some background research into this topic, um, and the, the, the awakening is not always a linear concept, and it rarely is. I mean, for Eckhart Tolle it was. Eckhart Tolle was living a, a pretty depressed, pretty yeah. sad life. And then one day, on a, I think on a bench, he has an awakening. He sees a diamond of some sort, and all of a sudden the universe is open to him, and you know he becomes the, the spiritual teacher he is. Other authors and other writers talk about how the concept evolves and changes, and you go on sort of the hero's journey, the Joseph Campbell thing. So it's, it, it's interesting because... I'll be honest, I've not met someone who's had an awakening like yours. You're, yeah. You're pretty unique in that sense. The Eckhart Tolle moment is interesting and from a philosophical standpoint, it's interesting because it doesn't need to be true. It could be a metaphor. We could all consider his moment and attribute it to moments of our own. And I think that's what I sort of felt reading that, that book. Um... An awakening for me also is not, it's not so uh, deliberate. Um, uh, a lot of uh, twists and turns in my life I had nothing to do with, you know, um, which has really shaped my outlook of the world as well because let's not get into it, but when you, when you have a position as I do on things like free will, the laws of physics, <laughs> um, <laughs> You don't uh, you, you don't take so much credit for how much uh, for how things how things are. Um, so that's interesting for me as well on the topic of awakening because yeah, a, a lot of it I certainly didn't have a hand in, and and that doesn't matter. Well, let's 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 step back a moment then. You you leaving aside the fatalism that that <laughs> that, that I think you're alluding to. Yeah. What are some active steps that... You, well, first things first, I should ask. Are you happier now that you've been awakened? Do you feel like this has been a positive thing? Yeah, uh, it's definitely been a positive thing. Um, I'm uh, definitely not someone who uh, places happiness per se um, uh, very highly um, as opposed to something like fulfillment. I was watching... Um, What's that rock climbing documentary? Oh, free, free, uh, free climb. Uh, free, no, free solo. Free solo, and uh, he was arguing with his partner and sort of suggesting that she's all about happiness and being happy and very places a, a high emphasis on on this element of her life. And then he he went on a rant during that doco, um, sort of saying that she she doesn't understand that for him it's about for lack of a better term, kicking goals, yep. uh, fulfillment. And um, my girlfriend, Cherise, turned to me and said, oh. <laughs> <laughs> just like you. But, um, so I definitely feel more fulfilled um, to bring that around. Sorry, I went on a, No, not at all. Somewhat of a rant there. But yeah, it, it, for me, it's um, the pursuit of knowledge, understanding, um, 
that may be what makes life worth living. Um, I don't get such a kick out of traditional warm and fuzzy happiness. Well, well, let's let's well, let's take a moment to talk about that then. The uh, the goal is to be fulfilled, as you've said, or at, at least your goal is to be fulfilled, and this awakening has helped you fulfill that. Well, <laughs> We're going roundabout now. But <laughs> would you say, or it, let's say that somebody was kind of at a crossroads in their life and they were sort of thinking, you know, maybe I'm not so happy in what I'm doing. Maybe I'm, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm achieving all of the, the external success that a person should have. But deep down, there's, there's got to be more than this. You may have just described most of the world. Well, that's right. And I've, I've, I've talked to you off, you know, off off the podcast a lot about this that I think that in general when it comes to society there's this real sense of ennui and sadness that sort of permeates society this generalized anxiety that everyone has like you know this sense of FOMO we've got different descriptors for it but there's this just sense of sadness that's so unfair that everyone seems to be carrying even though objectively they're doing well and I can only speak for my colleagues my friends the people that I see that objectively they seem to be doing okay they just never have enough, and the reality with greed or avarice is there'll never be enough. There's always a want for more. But how would you rate, or how would you convince, or how would you start the discussion with someone about, you know, are you ready to go on this awakening? What are some questions that you would ask someone to kind of gauge whether they're ready to take that journey? Well, on the um, question of sadness, happiness, um, I think that there's a serious lack of, um, let's say, reference point. Um, are you better off than your grandparents is not asked enough. Um, and in terms of taking the step um, to be on a journey towards fulfillment, let's say, you, you can only take that step from a, from a position of gratitude and appreciation. If you're moping about, and I don't, I, I appreciate that there's valid reasons out there um, for doing so, but it's very hard to make that make that step. I think unless you're um, you're doing so from a from a, uh, a place of understanding how lucky you are, um, especially in 2019. In a, in a country like Australia, like, you know, it's, um, I think we discussed the question on the podcast you did for, for me, um, um, the, the, the question of if you had to, uh, say, die and come back to Earth at any point, at any time, ever, when would it be? And it would be foolish to choose any moment but now. Yeah, absolutely. That's that's. Did I answer your question? You I, did. You did. Absolutely, you did. Um, so and you I answered it somewhat. You answered it well <laughs> too. You did a very good job. Um, it, it's with those sort of questions that you posed. You know, am I doing better than my grandparents? Or you know, um, there's always a subjective element to happiness. Mm. There, there's you know, there's always there's people who have nothing who are very happy, and people who have everything who aren't very happy. Um, are you saying? in sort of this awakening journey, because I've never thought of this, but this, I think what you're saying is quite logical, that we remove happiness from the equation, we remove sadness from the equation. You you are going to be more fulfilled if you choose to follow your awakening than you're going to be if you don't. I think the science is in. Um, happiness is a byproduct. Uh, okay. You know. Um, Elaborate on that for me. Well, you shouldn't pursue happiness per se, ever. Um set goals, um, what do you do, what do you want to do with this very short time we have on this very small planet and a very small solar system. Um, and yeah, ha happiness is the byproduct of fulfillment. Some people buy into the uh, warm and fuzzy version of happiness as fulfillment. It doesn't work for me. Um, but I'm sure it does for some, but, but it, it, even still, um, I wish I was a little little more prepared and I could um, perhaps point people to some papers 
We could do that in your um in your bio actually of your your podcast. Absolutely, um, we especially uh, some of Jonathan Haidt's work um, about this concept of happiness as a byproduct and pursuing it often ends in in um, some pretty miserable circumstances. Well, that's right. Well, I mean, there's there's so many philosophies and there's so many different frameworks that a person can pursue, and you know, there's. Yeah. There's the Stoics with Marcus Aurelius. There's hey, there's even people who purely seek pleasure. Look at Epicurus and his mob. Um, and what we're going to do, guys, once we figure out the teething problems, because this is volume one of what hopes to be a very long saga when it comes to podcasting, in the bios and the afterput, we'll put a little bit more material in so that we can um, sort of, if you're interested by the concept, you can go and, and, and learn a bit more about it. Here's a question for you, though. Which philosophers do you really respect? Both ancient and modern. Um, wow. I um, yeah, that's. It's like picking your favorite children. I know, but you've got to. <laughs> yeah. Um, I've just done a, written a paper on free speech. Yeah. Um, so I'm very much across and admire John Stuart Mill, John Milton, um, Thomas Paine. No relation to T Pain, the rapper. No, no, um, Spinoza, um, and probably Voltaire is very high on the list. The ancients, for me, um, ought to be admired for uh, you know changing the game, pushing the boundaries, the uh, the frontiers. Um, I don't like people who, uh, sorry, not individual people. I don't like the idea that people push um, that they're an Aristotelian or a um, Platonic um, person because there's just so much of their work that we can dismiss now. We, we, where we have better answers, we have better answers. And we can admire the ancients for really... Um, kicking off philosophy, I guess, but like I said, so much of what they said can be dismissed. Um, I think a lot of what's admired about the ancients is uh, the individual ancient philosophers are admired to the degree that what their philosophy represents fits in with one's already preconceived views of the world. So a lot of the Abrahamic religions cling to Aristotle because um, depending on which way you interpret, especially the metaphysics, um, he might be the first one who really pushed this idea of monotheism and God as someone or something that is stripped of all human attributes. So uh, naturally, the Abrahamic religions, I mean, that, that fits with what we think. Sure. Um, but yeah. Spinoza and, and Voltaire, for me, and I, I don't want to go down the uh, the anti-religion route here, but for me, they changed the game. Both were, I mean, Spinoza was excommunicated from the Talmud. I uh, forget the the, uh, the exact name. Talmud something community, Jewish community of Amsterdam. Yeah. And at, at that time, you can imagine, it was lucky it was in, in, in the Netherlands because they were one of the, the more free societies at the time. In another country, he, he may have faced a, um, a far more serious punishment than excommunication, but he was one of the first that really asked questions of these texts that so many find so holy, and I just find it so admirable. Yeah. Um, Voltaire... Um, we know is still relevant today because when events like um, the Charlie Hebdo um, atrocity um, happened, the French were carrying Voltaire signs through the streets. Um, he was for freedom of speech, but he was also for freedom of conscience, freedom of thought, freedom of religion. That might be a bit of a tautology. Those are all quite similar. But... Um, he and stood for freedom. He, he, he did. What he, what he saw, though, was that said freedom um, amounted to prosperity. There's an awesome quote, we can put this in the bio as well, about the London Stock Exchange 
there's the Jew, there's the Mohammedan, the Christian, and the only infidel in this case is he who goes bankrupt. <laughs> um, <laughs> like that. Yeah. I didn't hear that before. I like that a lot. There's also a line about uh, a, a one religion community um, is, is, can only be tyrannical um, based on there being one, one way of thinking. Two, you have an opposition. But three and over, you start to have a, a cauldron of different ways of thinking, um, which he thought amounted to prosperity and challenging each other's thoughts and ideas. So, again, I've, I've done a big loop there. No, look, Voltaire, Spinoza, for me, and those other liberal thinkers, are just amazing for me. Well, I mean, we have a, we have a saying in the law, um, which is, <laughs> Trouble never starts in a town until the second set of solicitors moves in. Because <laughs> when there's only one, it's easy. You know, it's easy. It's the interpretation of one. But once you get to two, three, four, problems start sort of emerging. And I think if I'm reading, if I'm reading your interpretation of Voltaire correctly, he goes, "Well, no, you need that volume so that we can actually have the have the discussion, review things objectively." Yeah, I think there's this underlying, or so it was probably an overarching theme rather of progress only happens through discussion and in the marketplace of ideas and bad ideas are only beaten or defeated defeated oh my god um, through better ideas in conversation I must say I, I've, I've only mentioned those guys who I do Truly admire, based on the paper I've just written, my um, my favourite philosophers certainly include the likes of Daniel Dennett and Sam Harris, of course, who you're probably sick of me talking about. I am is, never sick of hearing you talk, my friend. Yeah, which is probably a bit more relevant to my studies and my life moving forward. Um, the, the free speech crew are important for everyone. It should be compulsory for, especially in a time like this, with such division, um, certain groups wishing to silence others, um, a, a refresher course on Payne, Milton, Mill um, would do the world great things. Well, well, tell me this. People think, at least I certainly did until I started to getting to know you, do you think philosophy is a practical discipline or do you think it's a theoretical discipline? This is another one that I wish I had more time to conjure up an answer. There's this held position by some that philosophy doesn't necessarily have the answers, uh, rather it has the questions. Um, people can make, make that what they will. Um, in, in, in reference to your question. Um, well, let me rephrase it because I think that was, that's a very, I've asked you a question that philosophers have been trying to answer for 10,000 years. Obvious. I could give you more time. I don't think you'd have an answer because yeah. it's just one of those hard ones. But in your own life, in mm. your experiences, the challenges you face day to day, the life that you've lived, have you found that having an understanding of philosophy and different philosophical views has helped you to deal with practical problems, the way you look at a pro you know, the, the way you interpret a problem, the way you approach people. Has that helped you? And if so, how? Yeah, definitely. Um, that's a hard... Um, definitely because your approach to the difficult... The difficulty of life changes having... Um, just done a semester of or read a book of philosophy because you it said that like philosophy doesn't teach you what to think it teaches you how to think and you, you become far more equipped to deal with very very difficult problems I think some parts of the world and life change hands from philosophy to science, once we do know know the answer, this is a, again back to this view that I have. That, you know, once we have better answers, we have better answers. Yep. Move on. 
Um, but yeah, I, I, I hope I haven't butchered that too much in that um, that's what philosophy, that, that's probably the takeaway, that philosophy teaches you how to think rather than what to think. And that is a hell of a skill. And if, let's say that you've inspired a young person listening to this podcast, or even an older person, and, and they go, you know what, I really want to know more about philosophy. I want to, where do they start? Where's your starting point with the philosophy, in your opinion? And then I'll give people my opinion, because it could be very different. Yeah, I, I will be. I, I'm sure it will be. Um, I think we owe philosophy its full history. So even though I somewhat dismissed the ancients before, which is very personal, most people, I won't say most people, but some people love the ancients. But you should start at the ancients and move your way through and understand how thought and thinking has changed. Um, you can zero in on a specific philosophical topic relevant to you. This comes back to fulfillment, of course. Um, what do you want to know about? You know, that kind of, that kind of question. I'm now in, an era, in, a, in a position where philosophy of the mind and the tying in of law, ethics, and perhaps the neuroscience uh, therein is of importance to me. But some people obsess over the philosophy of language, um, the philosophy of love, um, or a, a specific epoch. Um, I have a, a lecturer that I've become close with who um, did a PhD in medieval philosophy, much of which, in the same way I said before about the ancients, I think is we're past that to a degree. But but you know, people do their doctoral thesis on specific epochs as well. So I definitely think we owe philosophy that much that you get if you're interested, you go through the history to a degree and then zero in what, what interests you most. Yeah, I, I think oh, you stole my answer. That's absolutely right. I think you. you I think. Something. I think you've got to start off with. You've got to start off with. You know, Socrates, Aristotle, Plato, Marcus Aurelius, Saint Thomas of Aquinas. I know you probably disagree with me on that, but no, I, I mean, Saint Thomas advanced Augustine's position that people like I, rather than being tortured, should be killed. So we should. Well, we should hear him out. <laughs> well, yes. He but said some valuable things. There's a, there's a great podcast called Pints with Aquinas. There's <laughs> lots to learn there. There really is. Awesome. Yeah. And, and I think that that's probably where I'd start. And if somebody wanted a practical example, I think that, do you know the trolley problem? Of course. So the trolley problem for those who are brand new to the concept is essentially there is a trolley cart rushing down a, a rail heading towards a tunnel. And in that tunnel are five people, so five workers who shouldn't be there. They're just hanging around having some lunch. And there is another tunnel, which the trolley can be diverted into, which has one person in there. Now, that person's meant to be there. He's doing his job doing maintenance. So the question becomes, if you have the power to, do you divert the trolley? Either way, somebody's going to die, either one or five. And it's the start of a very interesting journey that teaches you whether you're what's called a consequential ethicist or a, um, what are they, consequential and deontological, unless okay. I'm mistaken. A utilitarian consequentialist or a uh, deontologist. It's, um, yeah, I, I am still working on my answers for this one. <laughs> um, there's some recent studies that suggests that psychopaths are more inclined to be utilitarian consequentialists. Really? So there's some really prickly uh, conversations going on around the trolley problem at the moment, and people can't help but introduce their own version. You just uh, mentioned tunnels. Yeah. Some people um, would avoid saying tunnels, and crazy little variations like that affect people's answers and surveys on this. Really? Some people say, uh, some people use the example of uh, flicking a switch to divert the train and simply uh, pushing a fat man onto the train. I have heard that, yeah. Um, um, is is the, the, the variation here. 
the, there's one version of the trolley problem, there's a YouTube video actually, where the pushing of the fat man is done from a bridge above, and that changes people's answers. So it's, it's, as well as the numbers of people, a lot of people won't save five people and kill one, but a lot of people will save a million people and keep one. Um, the trolley problem is frustrating and fun and unanswered to a degree. I heard it when I was 19 and well over people. well over a decade later I still can't answer it because it's you know I've my I've had answers in fact when I was confident I had the answer was when I knew the least so it's one of those things where you sort of move forward that's funny you say that um, are you aware of the dunning kruger effect I am yeah now uh, correct me if I'm wrong but this is these two uh, these two scientists dunning and kruger who came up yeah. with the fact that psychologists I mean. yeah psychologists and the less you know about something, the more confident you are in your answer. Yeah. So that's why people who are grossly inept rise to the top because people who are generally more competent are afraid to put their hand up because they know they don't know. Yeah, if it is an, uh, an arena where confidence matters, in other areas it can be what bites you. Um, you can see it in real life, though, because you, you see students that have, I mean, okay, so let's, let's go to the law areas where you're an expert and I think I am. Uh, <laughs> you, you see students who have done a semester worth of contracts and they know everything. They know everything about, about contracts. But if you, sit, if you speak to a commercial lawyer who's been doing it for 20 years, they couch everything in, you know, I have to double check, um, there's probably someone who knows more about this than me. The the humility um, goes up, and the confidence or perhaps cockiness scales down. Yeah, if you get hit in the head a few times by a few judicial officers because you think you know more than you do or you haven't done the legwork, it absolutely comes back to bite you. And yeah. that's something I try to. Ins I mean, I, I don't know if I engendered it to you or it's still that in you, but you have to. You have to do the legwork, yeah. um, and you don't know all the answers. That's why the law wouldn't exist if everyone had all the answers. There'd be no point. Yeah, it'd be easy, really. Yeah, there'd be no interpretation. There'd be no review. So, um, I'm glad you say that because that's something that I found sort of regularly occurs. But yeah, this is philosophy. Yeah. Well, well, this this is awakening actually. So, <laughs> <laughs> so, so now that we've We've talked sort of about the awakening and sort of um, reviewed the the. Yeah. Tell me this, I'm at a I'm at a cocktail party, two days from now, and uh, you know I'm chatting to some intelligent people, and I want to kind of talk about the ideas engaged in an awakening. Can you give me three, four, five takeaway points that these listeners can 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 use to a educate themselves and b be jumping points for further conversation? Yeah, that's a tricky one. A lot of people don't want to hear about this stuff. <laughs> cocktail party, you might have, you might get kicked out. But this is an awakening cocktail party. Everyone wants to hear about it at length. They're interesting people. There has to be I do. a <laughs> there has to be an emphasis on going for it. Um, I mean, I started earlier by saying a lot of my so-called awakening was not um, deliberate or I can't take credit for. But a huge part of anyone who's had any kind of success towards fulfillment um, is a go-getter. Um, so I think any conversation has to start with a kind of what do you want, go get it type of, type of flavor. Um, I don't know what else I'd say there. Well, what's an interesting factoid that, that you've learned during your awakening that is just something that blows your mind, something that's really quite, you know? I've discovered that much of what I held sacred or was conditioned to think was of the utmost importance is not. Yeah, that, that would be, again, key, key takeaway. Uh, when you start appreciating 
some of the great philosophers and scientists, you really feel that you've not really done much with your life. <laughs> and and that feels good. Um, because I'm not dead yet. Um, and there's hopefully time to um, to achieve a bit more, or achieve something, let's say. Um, yeah, there's something of great value in um, being able to realise that some people have just changed the world, shaped the world. And perhaps what you were doing prior um, is, is not something that would uh, do that. Um, yeah, that's a real butchered answer. No, I, no, no. I, I think that that was perfectly fine. Basically, what you're saying is nothing is sacred. You've got to open your mind to sort of seeing it through different lenses. Yeah, definitely. I mean, talk to people. Um, have have what, what you hold as a belief questioned and challenged. How do you know that the world is round and not flat? Have you ever spoke to a flat earther? They're idiots. <laughs> but, 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 but tell me, how, I mean, you know, explain to me, how do you know the world's round? Can you do that? This is, this is philosophy. This is, um, this is questions. This is, this is challenging one's held beliefs. Um, a lot of people don't find such value in realizing how little they know. I do. Um, and the people that I choose to spend my time with do as well. It's not for everyone, but okay. Well, well, we're almost at the end. Um, Don't thank finish you. on that. That was dire. Well, no, yeah. no, no, no. Well, we, we always finish on the same note here, which you didn't know because this is the first one. That's a surprise. But, but, but essentially, I haven't put near enough pressure on you. This is I'm a podcast veteran. I've recorded at least seven now. Well, and this is your debut, and I've done nothing. <laughs> you've, 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 you've been a delight, which is quite contrary to your usual personality. So I'm just, uh, I'm, 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 I'm impressed and amazed. Um, and thank you so much for appearing. Tell me this. And this is the, the, the note we finish on. What would you say is the most important thing about awakening that the general public don't know? You may have to cut out my silence here, or I think. Take as long as you need. I, I, I mean, I, I hate to be on repeat, but, but uh, again, there's so much in the idea of being a go-getter and going and getting it. Um, it's, a, it's a rolling snowball effect if I've ever seen one. You know, to, to take the jump, um, to consider other things, um, affects one like, like, like nothing else. Um, yeah, but for me making these sort of crazy decisions in my age, I mean, I, I've had two careers prior um, and could have, could have stayed comfortable. Um, I'm very uncomfortable talking about myself like this because I don't, I don't think that I've achieved anything. Um, but I would encourage others to consider other things, let's say, um, if they're not fulfilled. There's no point sitting in your own mess um, and, and, and not cleaning it up if you're not where you want to be. I think that that is an excellent note to finish on. and uh, I don't think anyone will be putting that in inverted commas well, in their essays. <laughs> well, sitting in your own mess is an amazing... Well, it's, I think it's actually quite an apt analogy because a mess can be physical, it can be emotional, it can be spiritual, it can be psychological... Yeah. Um, it's just disorganization. And from what I've learned from you is the process of awakening is sort of disregarding a lot of this mess. I'm very torn on Jordan Peterson, but his clean up your room philosophy is uh, irrelevant to this point we're trying to make here. You know, little steps about, uh, little steps in areas where you're not so happy or fulfilled and uh, a lot of other things that you might, throw in the positive bucket um, 
can and will come your way. Well, that's right. I mean, I've, I, I, I rarely see anyone advocating. Well, I mean, there's the best that I've ever heard it put was that, you know, you should, you've got three homes. One is your physical body. So take care of it. Take care of your body. Take care of your mind. Two, your actual physical home. So keep it clean. Keep it neat. And third is the planet. You know, yeah. take care of that because you only get one of those. So you perhaps know. if I can, if you consider your body and your mind, not, not so much that you have a body and you have a mind, rather that you are a body and you are a mind. I think that um, perspective um, switch can create um, to the effect of what you were just saying. Um, but for all of this, what I yeah. take care of it. That was and is Mr. Rhys Lenadazzi, <laughs> a dear friend of mine, a very, very wise. And I, I, I disagree respectfully with your interpretation that you haven't done a great deal. You've done a lot and you've really impressed me. Um, that's it for the first podcast of Concepts with Calanter, everybody. Forgive me for any technical issues. Forgive me for hitting the mic and the the live stream starting early or late, those things will be uh, remedied in time. Um, if you guys could like the at Jahan Kalanta page on Facebook, um, that's probably where we'll be putting and hosting most of these. I'll let everyone know sort of how it's going to go and, and keep putting them up and hopefully we'll have more contact for you, content for you soon. Um, if you've got any criticism of the constructive variety, feel free to send that my way as well. Um, and if you don't like my face or mustache, feel you know I, I get a lot of that, so just throw that in the mix as well. But thank you to Reese, um, thank you to the Pod Hub for hosting this uh, hosting this pod experience. Because um, let me tell you, if I had to do it, there'd be a lot more technical issues than this. That's it for this week. Thanks, John. Congratulations. Thank you very much.